versus digital. It's the ye old debate. Is X better than Y? Unless, of course, you're talking analog synths and digital, because analog synths win all day every day. It's objectively true. What about televisions? Well, back at the start, it was a little different. It was a cathode vacuum sealed tube of black and white phosphor dots that illuminated people's homes and lives. Not long after that, Sony stepped in with what, not only one of the earliest commercial televisions, but the best colour screen for almost the entire productive life of these huge heavyweight displays. As is always the case with technology, when most learn of something, it is rarely, if ever, really new. Wi-Fi was around during the 70s, the internet in the 60s, and Cutler TV was around in the 40s, but really went mainstream in the late 60s. The same time Sony launched its world-class Triniton screens that everyone knows and loves. Here, I will use the first and most widely used CRT tube to represent them, that of the Shadow Mask set. And up against a very good and high quality Sony HD LED screen and test the question that crops up all the time, which is the best? Now to answer that we need to go into a little science, physics and good old fashioned analogue engineering. But let's first discuss how each of these technologies present their images. Now this is the first of one of the new sections I'm creating here which is called Living in the Past. Which the title really presents itself quite well. It is quite literally what it says on the tin. Are things better then than they are now or is it rose tinted views of things and are we really changing our perspective of what was good and what was bad back in the day. But I'm not going to get into the detail behind the video just now, I'm going to concentrate specifically on what I feel is one that is popular, certainly based on the fact that my most popular video has always been my how to set up your TV for games video, which is obviously very pertinent that most people need to use that to set up their LCD displays. CRTs were never really guilty of all those options, so that's partly the reason why CRTs were better for the mass market. But LCDs are not the same as CRTs, as CRTs do not work at all like these modern screens that you're likely watching this very video on. TV, phones, tablets or laptops, they're all the same. These LCDs or liquid crystal displays using fixed size panels with lights behind or at the sides to illuminate the relevant picture elements of the screen hence the word pixel, with the required intensity of red, green and blue RGB. Now how these panels are lit and managed do differ, but that's not really for this video and it's not really relevant maybe for another time. What is, is that they all centre on the restriction or obstruction of light to control the image and not the creation of it, hence why they are energy efficient. You also get active or passive panels such as TFTs, you often see these in thin PC screens as they can be cycled faster, thus are more responsive and accurate as the matrix construction and ICs in these active panels focuses the current and can be cycled faster and more precisely. But the core theme for all of them is they block light by vaulting the liquid crystal to unwind in a predictable way to let more or less light through and onto the screen layer via the relevant coloured cells. These tiny elements on the screen add up to the picture and are known as pixels with the relevant 256 shades of red, green and blue being the sub-pixel element. Now depending on your screen's resolution you will have three times the transistors that make up your TV's pixel grid grid, i.e. as here, a 1080p screen which is 1920 by 1080, that's across the horizontal and then the vertical. Hence why when I analyse games and state the game is X by Y resolution, this is the number of pixels the engine pushes out per frame. Less than the fixed pixel amount on your screen means you either have a smaller view if mapped one to one, as you see on screen at the moment with some retro gaming, or a stretching of the image to fill the screen which causes a multitude of issues, loss of temporal stability in movement, blurring, ghosting, among others. Now the reason is these fixed panel displays are, well, 
fixed. They have a set number of tiny dots or pixels that make up the image. In addition to this, they strobe light on and off via these tiny holes. It lights up based on the input data and then changes based on the next frame input. This is then polarizing the light to the screen you view. Now this snapshot of the image or sample is swapped with a new one 60 times a second or more. But due to image or color retention of the blasting of these displays and the voltage discharge of the crystal extension and the dissipation time of all this energy, thus you have a merging of information between frames or movement or a loss of new information that's coming from the next frame. This makes LCDs perfect for sharp, bright, static images but fast moving ones such as sport or games can suffer. Now in addition to the panels, quality, light methods, voltage, etc, all these things can vary from screen to screen. Now this is why most of these have game, sport or movie modes to try and balance the strengths and weaknesses to fit the relevant source. Adding in a source image that is lower than the native's panel's resolution with all these other issues I've just mentioned means quality and clarity suffer. Now the reason for this is the response times, the time it loses the image when you're refreshing it to the next frame. And that's why most of these modern TVs have all these new methods such as increasing the refresh rate of the panel. This is why you see these 100 or 200 hertz screens. Essentially, it attempts to try and swap images faster and as such cut down on some of the issues based on how fast our eyes and brains process the image. Another more effective method is inserting a black frame in between the two input frames faster than your eye or brain can consciously detect. Now this resets the display with a crisper look and reduces color blend or bleed between frames, reducing ghosting and improving blurring. Now these and other modes are trying to fix many problems these displays offer. Now QLED is another one that helps some of these issues, specifically color depth and slight ghosting improvements, but it does not solve them all and it has its own specific issues, cost and brightness, although brightness is always overblown as an issue. So that's LCDs, that's LEDs, that's all the screens you see, even OLEDs and QLEDs, they're all exactly the same. The only difference is how they light that image. Everything else that I've just gone through is exactly how they work. Just look up polarizing light and that explains how these multiple panels inside your TV actually display the image to the front of it, which essentially controls the amount of light coming off and through into the screen. Think of it as light reflecting off water. That is polarization. One element of that light wave is bounced in one direction, not all of it. That's effectively polarization in nature. So CRTs, what is it about these old school CRTs then? What makes them different? Well, the first is they do not use pixels at all. If you hear anyone say this, then they're wrong. They do have dots or phosphor dots or strips that run down and across the screen. And at first glance, it is easy to confuse them with pixels from our LCD displays, as I've just covered. A CRT stands for cathode ray tube. The cathode is a simple conductor of electrons and the anode, which is effectively a positive charge. And that potential, that difference like voltage, it really sucks the electrons from the back of the tube to the front. But the phrase or word anode and cathode are really analogous to positive and negative. That's essentially what they are. That's what they mean. And this is no more than a standard electrical circuit with the current running from negative to positive. Now this vacuum tube goes straight to the screen, the tube at the front, and these electrons, which are negatively charged, are then sucked straight through to the phosphor dots. There's a sheet of phosphor that sits on the front of the screen. You can see my badly animated process of trying to explain this here, and obviously the TV taken apart. Now this is the reason why they're so big and so heavy, because they are literally a huge thick glass tube, like a huge heavy bulb that runs across the, the depth of the TV, and you need that length. <laughs> yeah, you always need that length. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And that length allows you to shoot the beam down the screen and more specifically move it and aim it across the screen. And that uses basically copper wirings, which is electromagnetic magnets that pull that beam left to right up and down to drive it and draw the image on the screen. 
And that's what that huge part is at the back. That's the steering coil that's driving your image, which shoots the electrons down to the front phosphor, which is effectively anything that illuminates, absorbs energy and reacts to that energy. It glows briefly and then fades out again. That's essentially what's happened. So it's like firing a paint gun of energy at the front of the screen. Every time you hit that element, it flashes for a second, shows you the color that you want and then fades away. And that's repetitively what CRTs do. In colour CRTs, you have three electron guns, all pointed at specific points. You have an aperture mask or an aperture grill, which is a shadow mask, which is a, a sheet that sits between the phosphor screen and the electron gun, and then it blocks any parts of the electron, so it only hits the specific part, be it the red, blue, or green phosphor, and they emit that relevant light that they are supposed to emit when they get hit with the electron gun and that voltage level that they're hit with is the amount of electrons they get hit therefore it determines how bright the red the green and the blue is and that combination in that specific area gives you your specific colors which again is analogous to the subpixel element i mentioned on the lcds but unlike those, it doesn't draw an entire image in one go and just blat it on screen and then wait and refresh it. What it does is it draws a line and it starts from the top left and works its way down to the bottom right. Left to right, across the screen, all the way down. And then when it gets to the bottom, it moves all the way back to the top left. And this reset is called the vertical blank stage. And again, this, this action is called rasterization. And that's essentially what everyone knows about and I've talked about multiple times in previous retro videos, specifically the virtual racing video. Now, this is where the term racing the beam comes from, because that's literally what it is. It, they were designed around these screens, CRTs. And that's why all the old retro consoles, they don't draw full screen images, a buffer, which you see in modern consoles. They actually have all their memory designed around drawing that raster line, that row of phosphor dots, the RGB information at the screen per line. And therefore, all these tricks you saw in old consoles, such as the Mega Drive, the Super Nintendo, where the Mode 7 or the Half Bright Mode or splitting the raster shading so you could change the color palette midway down, these are all the techniques were all designed around around CRTs. And as you can see, these don't share many similarities with LCDs. And that's the end of part one of CRTs versus LCDs and my very first living in the past video. The second part is up now for my patron supporters and will be up probably by the time you see this. Obviously, it depends on when you watch it. So all these things are relevant only on the time I made the video. But I thought I'd split the videos up because I thought there's probably too much here for one video to take in. So watch this one and then when you want to check out the differences between both versions, the LCD and CRTs, where they differ, where one's better than the other, where one's worse, or whether or not one is even better or worse than the other. Take a look at that video when you get a chance and hopefully you enjoyed this one, that one, and everything else that I've put together. If so, then please like, subscribe, and share where appropriate. This is the part-time gig. I'm completely self-funded and independent, and I do all this on the side of my own spare time. So helping share and improve the channel's numbers and views really helps me immensely. And if you can, you can also buy me a sandwich, a coffee, a beer, or just say thanks for the stuff that I put together over on my Patreon site. Any pounds or dollars you can put together really helps me immensely. Not for profit, just to help me improve the quality and pay for some of the work that I've put forward. YouTube really isn't helping anybody help for money unless, of course, you're a big corporate entity. Anyway, that's it. I'm out. I'll catch you very soon on that next one.